Our union story is there to be seen We've won many victories and we've suffered defeats But as I turn through the pages and look back through time There's one single question stands out in my mind Today we may prosper, today we live free But if it weren't for the union, where would we be? It's our union, our union that defends our rights But our union's as strong as our will is to fight For the union is you and the union is me So stand up and stand by our union The streets of Sydney around the turn of the century the city was busy, a nation was being built. Workers were hard at it, but many had little protection and were open to exploitation. I'm taking the towels tonight to wash them at home. In the morning I'll be back to light the fires. Then I'll start up to clean. One night off a week, one weekend in three. We've been here since early, and we're waiting for a ship's cargo to watch. If I'm lucky, I'll get picked out today. If not, nothing to do but off home. Lonely long hours, low pay, hard and heavy work. These are the conditions for cleaners and caretakers at the start of this century. But conditions for others in Sydney were different. Wealth was shared unequally. The rich and aristocratic prospered while the workers rushed to produce. The stories of Sydney workers are like the stories of other workers all over the world. Stories of hard work, of people joining together in unions to gain strength. The Industrial Revolution changed work. Steam technology and repetitive engineering meant factories were built to produce growing amounts of product. Life in the factories was grim. 14 hours a day, harsh rules, poor pay, no protection from illness or injury. Workers organised to improve their lot. The union that was to become one of the biggest and most powerful unions in Australia began when 30 watchmen and cleaners met together in a small room in Trades Hall, Sydney. It was 1910. The executive met outside room 27 for the first meeting. I was mopping the stairs. I asked them why they did not include caretakers in the union. They replied the caretakers were the bosses. I pointed out there were three caretakers in the hall who had nobody to boss and there must be hundreds in a similar position. I said I'd like to join. At the meeting, the secretary recommended the inclusion of caretakers. I paid my entrance fee and became a member. The union was named the Watchmen, Caretakers and Cleaners Association and they found a strong leader in Joe Coote. Well, this union was different. Most of the unions that had gone before were unions of skilled workers, that's to say people who had a, a natural industrial bargaining advantage and who were or would have been industrially strong in their own right anyway, even without a union. But this was a union of, of people who had very little bargaining power. It was a union that was going to level them up and win for them the, the kind of security, protection and dignity that the other unions had won for their workers earlier. Nineteen hundred and eleven, and the union went to the industrial courts for their first award. Thirty shillings for seventy-two hours is better. It isn't great, but we're getting there. As usual, employers resisted. Caretakers. I give some broken down painter or carpenter a job and now they want to be a profession. They're in a union. And listen to this, union members are to be employed in preference to other persons. The union was recruiting members all over the city. The first full-time organiser selected by Joe Coote was James Vance Marshall. He was a hard-working radical. I remember being thrown out of every big firm in Sydney proper. The employers used every device to prevent union organisation expanding, including physically ejecting me. 
Police were often called to assist in throwing out union officials from city buildings, which they did with great pleasure. By the end of 1914, the union was known as the Miscellaneous Workers' Union. 1915, and the state branches combined their strengths into a federation, and so they became the Federated Miscellaneous Workers' Union of Australia. At that time, the workplace was changing rapidly. The employers started to introduce the ideas of Henry Ford, mass production. The idea was that the managers would do all the thinking and the planning, and the workers would do as they were told. The unions responded with action. In 1917, a strike started in Rail and Tramway's Randwick workshop when the government wanted to introduce mass production practices. Many unions, including the MISOs, were involved because every worker would be affected. The strike spread quickly. 100,000 workers, 82 days, two and a half million pounds in lost wages. The strike was lost, crushed by employers and the government. Nineteen fourteen to nineteen eighteen. The First World War raged and workers took up arms. Millions died in horrendous conditions. Over the top. First wave. The First World War affected the Australian Labor movement very strongly. People believe that all that bloodshed should not be in vain. And that there should be a, a new world fit for heroes to live in. They wanted an end to that old world that had produced so much oppression, poverty and bloodshed. New ideas about social relations were being thought and workers acting together were becoming a great force. The war with Germany has brought into existence a new power, greater than all the powers put together, the organised working class thinking internationally. And at any moment that international thought may be fused into international action. A single false step will spell disorder for the whole capitalist system. Australian Workers' Union paper. News came of the revolution in Russia. Australian workers heard of Russian workers who had overthrown the old powers and were trying to create a great democracy with great freedoms. There was real excitement. Society could be changed to allow fair and equal distribution of wealth. Australia was in the throes of social upheaval. In 1917, Harry Preedy brought paint workers to the Young Union. Preedy also brought the radical thinking of the international workers of the world that the Union was part of a world movement committed to peace and international socialism. When the paint section was formed, no less than four trade unions were approached to the Sydney Trades Hall, and the only one which was interested was the MWU. This paint section would later provide crucial industrial muscle for the MISOs. The MISOs sought more members from the most diverse backgrounds. Motor car washers. Lift attendants. Paint workers. Employees in motor garages. Flag makers. Bag makers and repairers. Sash makers and repairers. Bill posters. As well, the MISOs sought strength through amalgamations with other small unions. Tent and tarpaulin makers and machinists union. Billiard markers union. Licensed bill posters union. Elliots and Australian Drug Limited chemical workers. Some members wanted to lead the MISOs onto a radical road. Here was the turning point. Should the MISOs concentrate on wages and conditions, or should they join the revolutionary movements to change society? The first big struggle for the leadership of the union had begun. Joe Coote's leadership was attacked. First they moved to have the union motorcycle sold so that Coote could not organise. Then they found that he had not paid his dues. He was defeated in the next election. But the Radicals' glory was short-lived. They led in New South Wales for only 18 months. A world disaster overtook them before they could implement their plans. In 1929, on Wall Street, New York, the bottom fell out of the share market. Although it was half a world away from Australia, our economy was devastated. Every morning, more and more workers joined the waiting groups at the factory gates, hoping for the infrequent job. 
and more and more were thrown upon their own resources to earn a few shillings as best they may. The parts of the economy where the missos worked were savaged. Unemployment went through the roof. Future members of the missos went hungry. Families were thrown out of houses. Doug Howitt and Neil Byron remember well. Well, we were only kids at the time, you know, uh, but it, it made a big difference to our quality of life. We lost everything, our home and Father lost his job. No one else was working in the in the family, only the old man. And uh, he was only getting three pound a week and keeping ten kids. You know, he could suffer that, you know, and uh, I told the, the family that I was going to buzz off, you know. And so I took off and jumped the rattler and uh, listened to the stories, you know, in the, in the early 30s of... Uh, People wanting to change society, you know, there was lawyers, there was everybody on the trains. Odd blokes would get in the truck with you and, and uh, they'd talk all from at night about it, you know. Now you're going to change society, you know, there was no leadership. As capitalism shuddered, employers took the chance to claim wage reductions. The firm was uh, increasing, it was going along fine, but we got memos to say that from the following week we'd get a 7.5% um, cut in our wages. Now there was absolutely no cause for that. As a matter of fact, they should have given us an increase. And because uh, I screamed blue murder, and, um, but no, of course nobody then would support you because they were frightened of losing their jobs. And at the end of the week, the boss was in and came in a beautiful new big Dodge car and his wife was in a new fur coat full length. I said, there's our seven and a half percent wage cut, which of course it was. Even in these hard days, the union coverage was expanded. Lead workers. Asbestos sheep manufacturers. Plaster of Paris workers. Resin makers. Chemical workers. Plastics workers. Lino makers. Cork workers. Gardeners. The depression had undermined the missos. The economic recovery was slow. Most importantly, the wages and conditions of members were falling behind those of other workers. In the corroding shed at Balm Paints, Ray Pettith saw tough conditions. Lead, bark and acid, layer upon layer, up to 20 layers, formed a potent brew in the confines of this corroding pit. They built those up, or sometimes 10, 12, 20 tiers high, sometimes two ladder lengths to climb out, and the heat black dust all over you and uh, about three years I'd stayed there I think and that was long enough and I could uh, I don't know there was you could you were never feeling right well what would you do with this lead dust flying around and it's a killer the union seemed to lose its way decision making was paralyzed small groups dictated policy for the majority faction fought faction they were yes men Oh, pathetic. We were in a meeting one night, and old Bill Smith had an alarm clock and he was ringing the bell, how long he let him talk, and that sort of stuff. We're getting nowhere. The advance towards fair wages and good conditions in the union was stalled. After the bitter experiences of the Depression came the danger of fascism. Another world war erupted. Peace did come, and so came optimism and a new phase in the Missos history. The world had changed. Workers wanted more. They deserved more. Well, in many ways, the Second World War had the same effect on the Labor movement as the First World War. Again, people expected that there would be a brave new world. And they had plenty of reason for that too, because the governments during the war told them that it would be so. It had told them to keep their morale high that there would be things like a 40 hour week uh, and full employment. And people believed it. And they trusted in the Chifley Labor government to bring those things about. In the union, change was near. 
disaffected members and union radicals, many of them returned soldiers, saw that the leaders of the union were failing the members. They formed the protest committee and set out to challenge for control of the New South Wales branch. We fought the Second World War on the principle of democracy and that uh, a new way of life and a higher living standard for everybody concerned and great sacrifices were made in the Second World War and a lot of people got killed. So I think all of that played a, played a role in people wanting to, uh, to say the war's over now and uh, we want a better way of life. And the way to do that is that the union's there to provide the means of being able to improve our wages and conditions and living standards generally. The protest committee wanted change. The government of the union wasn't about to give up power to these radicals, so they changed the rules of the union. From 1946 on, the number of members needed to have a general meeting, the quorum as it was known, was increased to 1% of the entire membership. For this union, with small groups of workers spread widely, the quota was impossible to achieve. We never had a union meeting as such, because so you couldn't get a quorum. The fellows that were in the union before, they wanted uh, an astronomical number that you couldn't get them. Well, you wouldn't even get them these days now. Uh, basically, uh, one has uh, a fundamental understanding of the need for people to be able to express themselves in, uh, in a democratic way. And as far as uh, the union movement is concerned, it's based on the whole, co whole principle of freedom of expression. And here we were being denied the opportunity to even have uh, a say in regard to uh, matters relating to your own wages and conditions, let alone any issues which related to social questions or political issues. And uh, so it became a, uh, a great personal challenge then, that, uh, and particularly with my association with Jack DeWire and Jerry Saunders and Harold Facer and uh, many other uh, the stalwarts of that day, uh, I, uh, I felt that well, I had an obligation to do what I could anyway to, uh, uh, to defeat uh, the tyranny of these, these officials. The road to victory for the protest committee was long and hard. It took ten years, countless meetings and a mountain of energy. The two sides engaged in a war of words. Once again, your union is being called upon to repel a filthy smear campaign launched by the disruptionists within your ranks. Many of these are communists. Some are not, but their vile tactics follow usual party lines. F.C. Parker. The point is this. Democracy means government by the majority, and yet we find in our own trade union no opportunity to attend regular monthly general meetings to hear, discuss and decide democratically the vital issues confronting us all. Progressive circular to the members of the Miscellaneous Workers' Union. There had not been a legal general meeting in New South Wales for years. Meetings would be called, the quorum would not be met, and the meetings would be abandoned, leaving members angry and frustrated. Well, I went to some of them and they were just uproar, you know. Physical violence on some, some occasions uh, erupted. A lot of interjections and catcalls and disruptive uh, elements uh, appearing from all corners of the meeting. And, uh, chairman packing up and walking out, and taking all his books with him, <laughs> eventually <laughs> closing the meeting. Yes, they wouldn't face the issues, you know. The old union leadership used all sorts of tactics to defeat the progressives. They raised the quorum to 5%, more than 300 members. The executive decided to cancel Jack DeWise membership. Uh, and uh, I received a letter saying that your membership's been cancelled. So Jack and I then, um, uh, we knew of Lionel Murphy, a young barrister, told him of our um, difficulties and problems and he, he drafted an application to the Industrial Commission of New South Wales and went before Justice Richards and both of us were reinstated. Well, it was a fatal error on the part of our predecessors because that really made martyrs out of Jack and I because our, all of our, our supporters, were, you know, they cheered and were highly delighted that we'd been restored to membership. And if I then put a notice of motion uh, on to remove eight of the officials, eight of those to whom I and my colleagues felt were responsible for this uh, very undemocratic uh, and dictatorial attitude of, uh, of the union leadership. A special meeting was called by the protest committee for December 1953. This meeting is important 
to all those members fed up with bad conditions, because on that night, the fight to cleanse and strengthen the union will reach what promises to be a climax to the sell-out careers of our paid officials. Only that morning, Parker had registered a new and outrageous quorum of 20% of the entire membership. At the meeting, the motion was put to sack the old officials. Very turbulent meeting, very turbulent. Poor old Jack Dwyer got a, an umbrella broken over his head by one of the female people there that were supporting Parker. <laughs> They got a bit physical. Oh yes, they got physical, and uh, I was chased down the aisle, down the corridors of the trades hall by one old watchman who was on the Parker side, uh, who carried a, a, a walking stick with a, loaded with lead, and he tried to get me with it. Uh, a very explosive meeting. It was one in which uh, most of the people had come there to uh, to support the proposition, so I didn't have to be too elegant. I wouldn't have thought to have been able to succeed, but nevertheless, uh, when the vote was finally taken, it was carried 300 votes to five, and the five were the five officials who stayed. And they put their they foolishly put their hand up to and were counted. 1954. The battle moved to the courts when the incumbent leaders refused to accept the results of the meeting. This was the moment of truth. Whoever won here would control the union in the future. The progressives were represented by Lionel Murphy, who would go on to become a powerful force in Australian political and social life. The old leadership was represented by John Kerr, who would also become famous in Labor history. The case turned on whether Ray Geetzelt was a financial member when he had put the motion to dismiss the previous officials. The officials produced an old contribution card which showed that after Ray came back from World War II, there was no indication that he had paid the picnic levy of one <laughs> shilling. <laughs> he was asked whether he had paid it. He, all his supporters and the lawyers were aware of the significance. If he said he had paid, it would not be possible to refute it. If he said he had not paid, the case would be lost. All over this technicality of years past. He hesitated for but a moment before saying, I did not pay. As often happens, the court found a way around the problem. They relied on later records showing he was financial. The case was won. The officials were ordered to obey the resolution and vacate their officers. Ray and his colleagues, with the remaining officers, took over the affairs of the branch. Subsequently, uh, it was necessary, and I was advised by counsel again, if they're not prepared to vacate office, will you jump the counter and take over, which I, pro uh, I promptly did. The progressives, the radicals, had won. A little later, in the election for union positions, the protest committee members won an overwhelming victory. Ray Geetzelt became branch president, later general secretary of the Federation, and Doug Howitt was elected secretary. The revolution in the union had begun. It was time to back up all the pre-election promises with action. It wasn't just monetary increases we were after. There was a multitude of projects appearing immediately we took office, you know. The, the award was in such a bad way. The new leaders reduced the quorum from 1,200 members to 20, and a record number of meetings were held so that the rank and file could participate fully. Through membership drives, the union grew from 11,000 to 21,000 in four years. And the union's tactics changed. No more relying on arbitration. It was time for straightforward bargaining between the union of employees and the employers. We indicated to, uh, to the employers we're not interested in going to arbitration because arbitration only sets minimum rates of pay. Massive gains were made in most of the awards. More money and better conditions.
1957, and the battle was joined to break the bull system, which had waterfront watchmen waiting in line to be picked out by the boss, just as the wharfies had waited before. Methods of employment were degrading and inhuman. Lined like so many cattle, worker was played against worker, unionist against non-unionist, and those who protested didn't get a job. You, you, you'll do, and you can fight like dogs for what's left. You had to sit outside in that, in all weathers, for two or three hours every morning of your life and just wait for work to be offered to you. The watchman's tactics grew bolder. They had seen the power of direct action through the Waterside Workers Federation. I got one of the painters to paint up a roster board for me with all the numbers on it. Number 301, watchman number 301 was the first number on the board. We decided that by ballot and put the board up and the employer called for his, his labour. No one answered. And I said, that, right oh, there's your man, number 301, you can take him. He said he couldn't take him, he was off the roster. I said, he's all right. What's wrong with him? He couldn't, couldn't tell me what was wrong with him because he was a perfectly good, reliable watchman and everyone knew it. So they called the next man and the next man and so on and no one would go until number 301 took the job. And they exhausted every man on the roster. The, the, the members stuck firm to the single man. And uh, that was the start of the first strike. They won that strike. It was a great victory. The new leadership had shown what it could do. It knew how to use the power of the Labor Party and of the arbitration courts. And it knew how to back that up with well-organised action on the job. The New South Wales branch didn't have much money, but they set out to change and revitalise the union throughout the country. My job as Federal Secretary was to, uh, to look after the wages and conditions of everybody for whom we were registered, not only in New South Wales but every other part of Australia. Perhaps the first thing I really did was to go to Newcastle and set up a sub-branch in Newcastle because new members in Newcastle had been complaining under the old leadership that the no meetings were held, not being held, they couldn't get any, any satisfaction from Sydney and similarly down the south coast. From their base in the New South Wales branch, the Progressives went to the aid of Queensland. They went into Tasmania, then Western Australia, the ACT and the Northern Territory. Nineteen fifty nine. The Miscellaneous Workers Union took up the cause of dance instructors at the Arthur Murray Dancing Academy. The instructors had poor conditions and so they took action themselves, only to be locked out by their employer. The union stepped in and fought hard. The dispute went to court. We took the view that uh, they are entitled to industrial protection. Some unions should look after them. And uh, we changed our constitution continuously to, to cater for the industrial needs of these type of people. The result was the first successful prosecution of a company for a lockout in Australia's history. The union grew in strength and influence. New groups of workers across many industries were searched out, organised and defended. Paint laboratory workers. Pyrotechnics. Manufacturer of fibrous plaster sheets. Manufacturer and preparation of coated abrasives. Floor sanding and ceiling workers. Sisal craft workers. Independent schools domestic workers. Window display models. The union was growing so fast that sometimes new organisers had to jump in at the deep end. So I'd only been working at the union for a week when the word came through that Park Davis was on strike. Woke up at quarter past six, had no breakfast, had a quick shave, smoked another ten cigarettes getting out to Caring Bar where the meeting was. Didn't know what I was going to see, whether they was going to hang me or what was going to happen. Got to the, to the meeting and there was about two or three hundred people from the SDA there who was on strike and our group of people was about, as I say, the 50 or 60 odd. The delegate introduced me, opened up the meeting and I vomited down on my shirt and my suit. 
had the packet of cigarettes in one hand that went out into the road, the box of matches went straight after it. That was the last cigarette I ever smoked in my life. The women there felt sorry for me and they took me in and mopped me brow and made me a cup of tea and give me a bit of toast and said, you know, how unfortunate it all was. And I said, well, I'm only a new organiser. I don't know, you know anything about the award. I've never been shown. I don't know other things. So that was me baptism into me, me first stoppage. This union, unlike many others of the time, strove to meet the needs of women and migrant workers for social and wage justice. It hasn't been a, a situation where there are women members and there are male members, there are women's issues and there are issues relating to men. There have been industrial issues of members and those have been vigorously fought regardless of whether they were male or female. More services were being provided. Compensation offices, libraries, social events to look after the workers and families, even when they weren't at work. Nineteen sixty five. One of the union's biggest tests came with the shock election of a conservative government led by Robert Askin. This government decided to use contract cleaners in schools. The union resisted. The campaign began in April 1966 at Canley Vale High School. On May 4, school cleaners throughout the state stopped work. In Sydney, the town hall was filled to capacity. These school cleaners, these miscellaneous workers, took to the streets and marched on Parliament House. 10,000 people united and become one and marched down George Street and stopped traffic for two hours and hit headline news. And probably the only time that a, a Liberal government capitulated to, you know, change a decision. I think that showed what people could do if they massed together and you had solidarity. After that battle, the union seemed to get stronger, if anything. Childcare workers, laboratory workers, makeup artists, artists' models, CSR sugar and timber workers. The union grew through amalgamations as it had in the early days. 1967 saw the largest amalgamation to date with the Leather and Allied Trades Union. Like many missos before, leather workers worked in small factories with poor conditions and little power to improve them maybe 10, 15, 25 people. That, that was the complement of the factories and so uh, they'd sack them, you know, uh, on any pretense or anything like that. So uh, it, it made it that the wages level was pretty low for a skilled trade. And as soon as Ray got on the job, well, they got well, dramatic increases because of, you know, we had a pretty good front runner when Ray had the, got in with a chamber of manufacturers, he belted the ears off them. <laughs> and we couldn't do, we didn't, we didn't have the capabilities or the know-how. Asbestos kills. The union had covered the workers in the asbestos manufacturing industry since 1929. As it became clear just how dangerous asbestos was, a health and safety struggle began. The machinery they had was totally inadequate to protect anyone from dust. There was no steps taken to protect them at all. There were festoons of asbestos cobwebs from coming down from all the rafters in the factory, uh, hanging out the windows where they'd been blown out by fans. And workers were subject to breathing this dust in there. And uh, the factory was closed down and, and pronounced unfit for human habitation. Uh, my idea is 
or my philosophy in relation to asbestosis, unless the worker is 100% protected from as the dangers of asbestos, well, he's best not work in the industry at all. That was one factory, but a whole industry had to be changed. With many years of agitation and information gleaned from all over the world, the union led the fight to recognise the dangers of asbestos and to introduce safe working methods. Industrial issues are important, but the union was committed to look beyond. To truly advance the cause of working people, the union needed to change society, to change the way laws were made, to impact on the way the country was governed. Often the members went to the streets of the nation to put their strong views. It's not just a matter of getting uh, shorter hours or higher pay. It's, there's more to it than that. I'm not a professional demonstrator. It's only things that, that I'm interested in and I feel uh, it deserves support. We don't go along like a lot of rat bags. And unions should be concerned about these world events. Those world events are going to affect their members. As time moved on, the Missos came to influence the union movement itself and the Australian Labor Party. Nothing shows that influence more clearly than the story of Bob Hawke and his challenge for the leadership of the ACTU at the 1969 Congress. I was a member of the Clarks Union, but at that time they didn't seem disposed to make me a delegate for reasons best known to themselves. And uh, I'd become a um, commissioner for affidavits and with uh, what is appropriate when you're talking about a miscellaneous workers' union, it was that miscellaneous that had covered commissioners for affidavits. And so uh, I went to the 1969 Congress as a fully accredited, fully paid up member of the miscellaneous workers' union. So in a very direct sense, I owe my election as president of the September 1969 Congress to both the imagination of uh, Ray Geetzel and uh, his great support and the support which uh, his union gave to me. By the end of the 60s it was evident that the union was a very powerful influence in the Australian labour movement. It had influenced the election of the president of the ACTU and it was supplying much of the organisation in the campaign against the war in Vietnam. And its very ability to do these things so well meant that its opponents on the right redoubled their efforts. The great split in the Labor Party of the 50s had pitched faction against faction. The simmering battles exploded in the Missos in the 1971 and 1974 union elections. It was a union that wasn't afraid to use its influence. And uh, to that end, it sought it to ensure that the uh, progressive people were uh, in the leadership of the union and sought to assist progressive people in industrial and political areas. The Conservatives wanted to control it and the third great struggle for the union had begun. Four disgruntled organisers headed the campaign in the 1971 union elections. The fact that they wanted to run for office, that was their democratic right to do so, and any, anybody could do it. But I was concerned about the, the, the people who that they actually were the front for, and I felt that the election of those people, my candid opinion was, the election of those sort of people would have been a disaster for the union, and it would have probably destroyed everything that we'd struggled to get. From 1970 to the next election due in 1974, the leadership of one of the biggest unions in Australia was under constant attack. Those challenges were financed by outside forces uh, and there is documentary evidence of involvement of uh, the Labor Council of New South Wales leadership 
and uh, of the National Civic Council. Members of the union mobilised to defend their leaders. They fought hard. I worked at the university then and the teachers college was a separate section and there was a big fence separating the two and at six o'clock in the morning I climbed over the fence and went into the teachers college which at that time had 45 members and I could have been sacked because it was illegal, you know, and I wasn't supposed to be in them premises at all. And anyway, I took a chance on that. And so I went in and had a meeting before they started work, the members, and, you know, to vote for, to keep our leaders, and um, they all did. The opposition called themselves the Better Deal team. They door knocked members and published pamphlets full of anti communist rhetoric and accusations. Keith Blackwell, then secretary of the branch, bore the brunt of some less peaceful strategies. It got to the stage where we had to do something about the farm. It was ringing all hours of the night, ringing up, get him out, get that bastard out of bed, we're going to kill him. And because Keith would never answer the phone. In the early hours of one morning, a bomb went off at the home of Arthur Geetzelt, Ray Geetzelt's brother. People who are engaged in that, those sort of uh, tactics uh, are just... Uh, uh, gangsters uh, just didn't. Uh, it was a matter of concern for my wife and kids, but it didn't, didn't worry me personally. Uh, there was no way they were going to get me to back off, or for, for that matter, any any of my colleagues either. As it turned out, the hard work of the members and officials paid off. The 1974 union elections were won easily. Another result was the historic conviction of two members of the Better Deal team for stealing ballot papers. If the battle had been lost, the nature and direction of the union would have been very different. One can only assume that the deal that was done was to ensure that the strong militant attitude that the MWU had to wage in conditions negotiation would dissipate. In the meantime, the struggles for better wages and conditions against the resistance of employers had continued. In 1972, the Missos took up the Shorter Hours campaign. In the 70s, the Missos played some decisive roles in the politics of New South Wales. After Lionel Murphy had left for federal politics, Neville Rand came to represent the Missos in many important award campaigns. Later, he was assisted by the union in his attempts to become leader of the Labour Party. One of the great social changes has been women's rights. The struggle for equal pay was central to those rights and the Missos joined the fight. I am a union woman as brave as I can be. I do not like the bosses and the bosses don't like me. We are many People I work as a man and I get paid as a woman. So I thought, well, I'll dress half as a man and half as a woman. All these things were handed to us on a platter plate. All these things had to be fought hard for meetings and demonstrations and and and, and deputations and you know you didn't get a hand to you. I mean, I had two children to feed and keep, and I came out on strike and I didn't maybe didn't have the price of a loaf of bread. But we fought these conditions, you know, and and uh, it worries me now that the young people don't realise what the older people had to go through to win these conditions. And when the strikes are on, they don't seem to be interested. By the beginning of the 80s, the union looked after over 400 awards, and there were 110,000 missos nationally, 34,000 in New South Wales, with more joining every day. These achievements would have been impossible without the work of dedicated delegates and the rank and file of the union. The newly elected delegate on the job is a leader. We have trebled the number of delegates that we have in the field and they are continuing to grow. Big job educating them, big costs bringing them into delegates classes, but investment in the future of the MWU, that's really what it is. Bob Hawke! In 1983, the man the Missos supported for ACTU president became Prime Minister of Australia, 
and brought sweeping change. The historic accord was reached between the government and the labour movement. In 1983, we for the first time ever in our history as a union in Australia, realised our capacity to participate in the government of Australia because we were finally given an opportunity. The nature of trade unionism was changing, changing fast. There is nothing more enjoyable than having a brawl with a boss. Nothing more enjoyable in this life than booting the hell out of the boss. And we're all taking a fair bit of readjusting to doing it another way because it brings people together in a much more thoughtful way. Um, they've got to really sit down and analyse what they're about. Uh, and I think that's going to make a more sophisticated union in the 90s. Coverage still expanded. Sailmakers. Librarians. Home care workers. Private domestic workers. Monorail workers. Disabled workers. With the Accord and the Labor government, had come the ideas of award restructuring and workplace reform. Work would be organised in new, more democratic ways, with workers having more say, more training and more rewards. You can't sell trade unionism in 1991 on the basis that you achieved superannuation in 1985 or annual leave uh, loading in the 1970s. That's important. We ought to be proud of our history. But you also got to ensure that you've got an ongoing plan of action about best positioning yourself to secure appropriate wage and conditioning outcomes, but also about improving your service in the field. And the MISOs every year have a new plan of action. As we build the resources, and I still refer to myself as being part of that union because I'm a member and proud to be a member, and you've got to look to what we can do in the future to provide a better service to people. Because you ever think that you've done as much as you can, then frankly you ought to get out of the union movement because you are not living up to what workers expect of you. By 1991, the Miscellaneous Workers' Union, which had started with 30 members in that tiny room in Trades Hall, was 135,000 strong and had moved into its new headquarters. In 1992, the biggest amalgamation of them all was achieved when the Missos and the Liquor Trades Union amalgamated to form a massive and progressive trade union. The new union was dedicated to protection, service and strength. But would it be able to deal with fundamental challenges in a sometimes hostile future? The basic philosophy of labour is simple to me, and that is that you use the organised strength of workers, if we're talking industrially, or of the community as a whole if we're talking politically, to try and maximise growth on the one hand and to equitably and decently look after those who are least able to look after themselves. Those principles don't change. They are fundamental. But if you're going to be able to give effect to those fundamental principles, then you have to be organisationally flexible and forward-looking. That, in my judgment, has been the strength of this great union and its leadership. The world is changing all the time, technology is changing, dramatic changes are taking place at the workplace. Uh, there's, uh, there'll always be the requirement for a strong, independent and democratic trade union movement to be, to be able to look after the wage and salary earners, uh, irrespective of, uh, of what happens in the future. If you abolished unions tomorrow, uh, you would need to reinvent them next year because people would uh, become so exploited and they would very quickly decide to band together because that's why unions came into existence, for people to get together and uh, give themselves some bargaining power and to give themselves some strength against uh, employers. It gave me satisfaction to work for a place like the Mesos. I thought they were caring, not only to their members but also, as I said, to their staff. And it was a different atmosphere to working anywhere else. I'm concerned. I feel that the things could de degenerate into a thing that happened about 50 years ago. And if they don't continue in, in unity and continue with the trade union movement, a lot could happen. It could change the face of Australia. Don't think about it. Do it. Join the union if you want protection.
you still have these disparate groups of people with huge variety of backgrounds, huge variety of skill levels that want and require collective assistance. So, you know, in a sense, nothing changes. Those who occupy positions within the FMWU are but passing guardians.